This video is a documentary on the process of printing and assembling a serpent musical instrument using 3D printing technology. The original serpent that this is based on is in the Bait Collection in Oxford, England. Their catalog number 500 and it's known as the Dittus instrument. This particular original serpent is regarded as a good example, a good playing example, and Mark Witkowski of the Imperial College London collaborated with bait curator Andy Lamb on a project to scan and design 3D printing files to replicate this instrument. Mark Witkowski generously allowed me to use his files and since I did not own a 3D printer, I enlisted the assistance of my brother, who kindly uh, spent about one week using both of his 3D printers to produce all the necessary parts. A number of times in this video, section numbers will be mentioned. And while we're still looking at this picture, you can see there are quite a few seams or joints in the instrument. And this is largely because it was designed to be printed on home use or hobbyist size 3D printers rather than industrial ones. And therefore it has to be made in smaller sections. The Serpent being a fairly large instrument requires a lot of sections. So starting at the bell end, that's the large end, that is section 1. And immediately to its left is section 2. Counting around clockwise, we get 3, 4, 5, 6. Section 6 is the first one to have finger holes. And then we go to 7, which has 1.5 holes, 8, 9, 10. And then going to section 11, we have another finger hole. And that also has two more finger holes on it. And then 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. 19 and 20. 20 is actually partially under the gold colored band which slips on over it. So that's one section there, uh, both black and then underneath the gold part. And then the bocal, which is the smaller part, and on a serpent which is usually made from wood, the bocal is made from metal. Of course, this entire copy of it is being done in 3D printing technology, so it's all plastic. And the bocal starts with its own numbering system. So the large end, which plugs into the small end of the instrument, is bocal section 1, and then 2, and then 3 and 4 are the curve, and then 5, and that leads down to the mouthpiece, which itself is in two pieces, mouthpiece section 1 and 2. A few words about what the original instrument is. The Dittus Serpent is just one example of a common type of serpent called the Church Serpent, also known as the French Serpent. This is the original design of serpent, dating from approximately 1590. According to most researchers, there are some disagreement about whether they're may have been an earlier variation of it coming from Italy. And this is distinct from the later military serpent, also known as English serpent, which has a somewhat different shape. Anyway, so this is a French church serpent design, and in that regard it's quite conventional or typical of the type. Now a few words about the 3D printing process. This is basically a three-axis positioning mechanism, so it can move left and right, forward and backwards, and up and down to precisely position a printing head at the correct location. And it builds the desired component to be printed using an additive process, so it just starts with nothing and then adds material to it until you get the final shape. It's the reverse of sculpture, essentially. 
and a computer operates the printer to move it through all of its necessary complex motions and to apply a plastic filament which comes off of a reel and that goes through a melting nozzle which reduces it to a molten form and then it is applied at the exact XYZ position on the part as it's developing during printing. And this all starts with an original design file which stipulates all three dimensions of the part. Then another program called a slicer takes each part that's already been designed and figures out how it's going to actually be printed one layer at a time and that's what the slicer program does is it figures that out and that can be different from printer to printer as we will see in this video uh, the two printers that were used for this have a different philosophy in their slicer program as to how certain things are done so I will comment further on this as we look at the printing process and I will say at this time that we made a choice as to which type of plastic would be used to print this serpent. A better choice might have been to use ABS plastic, which is a very common plastic used when, it, when musical instruments are made from plastic, such as recorders, for example, uh, plastic trumpets, plastic trombones, which are becoming more common, are typically made of ABS plastic. For that matter, Lego bricks are made of ABS. However, in this case, we decided to use so-called PLA plastic, uh, which is standing for polylactic acid, which is a form of polyester. Uh, this is more friendly than ABS for printing in a home environment because it doesn't give off the noxious fumes that ABS does when it's melted for 3D printing. So the choice was again made to use PLA plastic and we bought two different colors, one in black and one in a gold color to simulate polished brass for the vocal part. Okay, this is the Prusa printer making what I believe is section one right at the bell end of the instrument. The uh, part is getting wider towards the top it's flaring a little bit and it's not too far from being complete. You can see here that the bed moves uh, in and out and then the print head moves sideways and also up and down on a set of screw jacks all under computer control. This is on the Prusa printer and the preparation here is it's already gone through the slicing on a desktop computer that was transferred to an SD card and taken to the printer plugged in and all the files appear on the screen here and the uh, part is selected it first is doing bed heating here it warms up the actual bed of the printer also known as the build table or the plotting table various different names I've heard Here's a bit more of an overview of it. Multiple cameras going on here to get different angles. I think one of them is taking constant video, another one is doing um, stop motion. There's some statistics here on the screen about uh, different settings and so on. And I should mention that the bigger parts on this serpent took roughly 16 hours to print each. Obviously the smaller parts took less. There's the print head and there's the PLA filament coming in the top from its reel. There's a bit of a cooling fan or two on the print head and there you can see some molten plastic dripping from the print nozzle. There's some sensors on the print head. It's still oozing a bit. Bit is still heating. And let's see, I don't know what else is on here that's going to mean anything. There may be 
when it says 100%, that may mean that it's printing 100%. Not sure. Because it is possible to print these files at various fractions of the normal size. But here we're doing it 100%. Now the printer does a calibration process where it uh, makes sure that the head is in alignment with the bed. Now I was under the understanding that the bed adjustment here is automatic, uh, whereas on the other 3D printer that will be shown in a bit, the bed adjustment is manual using thumb screws. But it's doing some sort of a measurement here to uh, verify that once it starts printing, the relationship between the print head and its positioning mechanism and the bed are in alignment with each other. And let's see. It seems to be printing a initial bead just to get the the head working and now it's printing an outer circle. So X and Y dimensions here but the Z is not changing. And you'll notice on this that it seems to print an outer circle that is not part of the part. And what I think that is is a periphery mark. I don't know that for a fact, but that's my supposition. In other words, the part is going to get bigger towards the top, and once it gets to the top, it'll probably be in alignment with that outer circle. But that's going to be just scrap plastic down at this layer. So the printhead is putting down the initial layer, uh, which is uh, 0.2 millimeters thick. And you can see there that the alignment pin holes are being printed at this time. They don't look like much yet because it's not complete. And you can see why it takes so long to print these parts. It has to lay down an awful lot of plastic, and it isn't exactly speedy. And to build up these fairly large parts does take a long time. There it's maneuvering around to print the uh, hole. Now it's moving in to do what's called the infill. These parts are all printed using a specified inner and outer skin thickness and then the space between the inner and outer skins is filled with the infill and the slicer program determines what the infill will look like and that can differ depending on the slicer program but since this is the uh, very bottom or the end of the part it's not actually doing a um, an empty infill it did a solid infill because the end of the part needs to be solid. But as we get further into the part, we'll see that it's leaving a lot of air space in there. Uses less filament, takes less time probably. And in this case, it can make the acoustical instrument uh, resonate a bit more like if it was made out of wood, which would be the original material. The degree of infill, in other words, the amount of plastic versus airspace, is stipulated by the uh, designer of this project. Now you can see the clear alignment holes that have been printed and how the part does not include that outer ring. Now it went around and did that again. I'm not sure why. For all I know, that may be just a head cleaning thing. Really no idea. And here's a still picture of the first layer completed. Now that we're getting further into the printing of the part, you can see the infill here 
with this zoomed in view that there is quite a bit of air space. The particular slicer used on this printer makes it kind of a wavy line matrix but on some other printers it may be more like a set of wagon wheel spokes or something. Uh, again that's up to the slicer and is not part of the original design. Once it became apparent how long it was going to take to print this serpent's many pieces using just the one printer, the Prusa, it was decided to bring into action the older printer in my brother's arsenal, which is a Creality model. And it works well, but it has some downsides compared to the Prusa, so it was in the wings, but now it's going to be used. So here's the Creality unit. It's heating up its bed and presumably the print nozzle as well. Similar information on the display to the Prusa. And I actually think this model looks a little more industrial than the Prusa. A lot more metal parts and so on, but you can see here the white uh, thumb screw rings below the bed, which jack the table up and down at the corners. So the printer is just blowing a little uh, molten filament along the side of the bed. Now it's going to get busy. You might be able to perceive here that the texture of the bed is rougher than the smooth one on the Prusa. It's doing the outer ring here. At least I think that's what it's doing. Okay, now it's getting busy with the actual part. It's starting at the other end of the instrument. This, I believe, is section 20. This is the small end of the body of the serpent. You can see it has the alignment holes in there already, and the inner and outer diameter. And it's starting, I believe, with the small end. And so, again, that outer ring might be in line with the larger end after you account for the tapering part. You can see that little uh, weather vane looking, or uh, anemometer looking piece, which is, uh, I don't know if it's just an indicator or if it's also a, uh, a finger grip for the feed mechanism you can see a roller and a, a knurled roller pinching the filament and then it pushes the filament through that white tube and that way it's much like a MIG welder or something of that sort. And there's the left and right stepper motor and there's the belt for the forwards and backwards positioning. It's a lot harder to see what's printing on this than the other model, just due to the layout of the components. You can see here how it's doing, instead of the more um, artistic <laughs> uh, pattern that the Prusa did, it's going with a very straightforward hatch pattern, um, just using straight lines for the area between the inner and outer um, surfaces of the part. And there's the Prusa off on the left, busily doing its thing with another part. And here's the Creality machine working on its part. Again, this should be part number 20, the vocal receiver part. It's got quite a thick wall here because it has to account for the um, the inserted vocal but uh, you can see here that the infill doesn't have all those wavy lines that the Prusa uses it's either a grid pattern or sometimes it's a bit more like um, wagon wheel spokes you can 
can see the relative thicknesses of the inner and outer skins. Uh, I forget what we set those for. That is a variable you can uh, set up in the printer, um, or in the slicer, rather. It's not part of the original design file. I believe that the original design file just shows a solid part, and you could have any amount of infill that you want and stipulate that at the slicing stage. Still with the Creality printer, we're now making another part. Or is it? No, I think it's the same part. It's just getting a little bit further up. I suppose that having the infill be largely air slows the printing process down. It may take a lot more time to print all those little infill surfaces than it would be if it was just making a bunch of big round patterns to fill the whole layer up. Meanwhile, we're back to the Prusa here, and here you can see that curvy infill by contrast to the Creality printers in fill. The Prusa printers laboring away at section four, which is uh, near the bottom. Actually, I'm not sure if that's four or five, come to think of it. It might be section five. Um, looks more to me like section 5. The um, curvature here means that the part ends up quite a ways off to the right by the time it gets to the top than where it started down at the bed level. And here you can see that due to the curvature, the top is not flat with the plane of the printer anymore. It's at an angle going up to the left, but the slicer program takes care of that and make sure it skins over the part that is not going to be infilled. So that's all taken care of by that software. And you can see the alignment holes there. Now interesting, the alignment holes here are not straight up and down because the plane of the end of the piece is sloping up to the left. The alignment holes are also sloping in that direction. Back to the Creality, still working on, now this is a curved part. I'm supposing this is part number two since it finished with part number one at the vocal receiver. So I've got a bit of a curve there. And because it has to work with the larger vocal receiver part, it has an exceptionally thick wall at this point. So the inner taper and the outer taper are not exactly in line at this stage. So the Prusa has finished part number four. When I supposed it was part number five, I'm pretty sure I was wrong. It is part number four. Meanwhile, back to the Creality printer, it has finished part number 19 two different views of it here. And now the Creality has finished part number 18. The Creality is now nearly done with part number 15. And once again you can see how the infill is being done in between the inner and outer skins. And you can easily see from this angle how each part is built up a little bit at a time. Each layer is set to 0.2 millimeters thickness. That is adjustable, but uh, it's what's being used for most of these parts. Another layer.
player starts. The Prusa was not only used for the smaller end of the serpent, the ten parts on that side of it, it was also used for printing the bulkle and mouthpieces. And interestingly enough, two parts are being printed simultaneously here. Parts one and parts two. Part one would be the one on the left. That's the one that goes into the uh, receiver on the small end of the instrument. So it has a bit larger diameter. And then part two is to the right, and it's smaller in diameter because, of course, the whole thing constantly tapers. And here we are obviously using the gold-colored PLA filament. Now there is some aberrations in the printing here. You can see some glitchiness in the surface. And this was deemed to be unacceptable after a couple parts were made. And these parts were all reprinted um, with a resulting better finish. But for the meantime, all of these printing shots show the first set being printed. Here the conical section of part number, vocal part number one that is, on the left is visible, followed by the tapered section below it, which is intended to wedge the vocal into its receiver, and then below that it assumes the normal shape. I wonder if those uh, aberrations on part number one are the result of printing two parts side by side because the nozzle never really stops feeding cleanly and perhaps that's where the uh, head jumps from one part to the other on each layer and it may jump from a slightly different position on the part and leave just a little whip of um, plastic sticking out where the head uh, moved away from the part. That would be my guess, but it wasn't exactly spelled out to me that way. I don't really know what was done the second time to prevent that, but it may just have been to do one part at a time. Obviously the printing of these parts goes much faster. There's just a lot less area to print. Vocal part one is shorter than vocal part two, and you can see that the printer's already done with part number one, including a slightly uh, tapered end to it, and now it's finishing up vocal part. Um, actually, this is vocal part five, I think. Actually, I was thinking it was two, but. It looks like it's five because it's uh, curving the end over like that. Yeah, I think uh, that must be vocal part number five. And that would be the mouthpiece receiver right there. The hole in the middle, that is. It's still trying to do an infill there, but it's a tiny infill. And it's done. There's a little saliva string hanging off there. 
And here are the finished first time attempt. Vocal part five on the left and vocal part one. Well, the other way around. Vocal part one on the left, vocal part five on the right. Okay, here the Prusa is printing vocal parts 1 and 5 uh, the second time around. And again, I don't know what the difference was because it does seem very apparent here that they were still printed side by side, but something was done differently. And you can see there isn't all that uh, aberrational spotting along the, uh, the left part. really just finishing up the top of part number five. up the end of it a little bit and it's done and you can see these look a lot better than the first time around little burr there's always some debris which has to be cleaned out so now that the printing is done I'm going to slip in this video that was taken during the slicing of one of the parts. I'm not sure which part it is at this point. Uh, I think it's probably section four. So it was rotated and placed on the bed and um, some futzing around here. There we go. I don't know the significance between it going from green to yellow. Maybe that just means the calculations have been done for the infill. That would be my guess. And now the sliders turn down so we telescope all the way through all the layers. And you can see what the first layer is going to look like. The uh, violet part is the infill that is flat, and then as we move up, it goes to that wavy lattice-like structure. And now the um, angled face of the part is visible. And here's where you can really see how the alignment hole starts getting formed at an angle to be perpendicular to the face at the end of the part. You can see the hole is sloping to the upper right. There's a bit of math that goes on there. And then we go up to the top and the whole thing is sliced. Here is the promised time lapse of printing section number four. Meanwhile, the Creality is being serviced in the background. All right, on with the 3D printed serpent. I've already shown the videos of the pieces of the serpent being printed on 3D printers. And now I've received the whole kit 
of parts, conveniently stored in a cardboard box and labeled. Let's unpack them and see what's here. Okay, here they are, and it's uh, pieces 1 through 20, which I'm going to have to uh, probably investigate whether I want to mark those differently, although it should be pretty apparent they're all tapered. Even if the labels come off, it should be pretty easy to see how they go together. There are two bags of bulkles here, bulkle parts. <laughs> this is called the uh, Bokel 5 Worm, and it actually has a bell flare on it of sorts. I have to check out what that's all about, because the worm is a uh, nickname used for a soprano serpent. And that one's Bokel 5. That's obviously the one the mouthpiece plugs into it. It doesn't have any alignment holes on the end of it. And this is Bokel 1. I uh, believe this is the part that fits into the, the small end, I think like that. And there's also a recessed area yeah, which takes the decorative ring, so that's how that would go. I think it's pretty much like that. It does seem like all those parts are there. Everything here was printed in a black PLA, except for these bulkal parts, which were printed in a gold PLA. There are little blemishes on this, but nothing major. And everything has alignment holes, except for the, the small end and the, the bell end. This is the other bag. These are listed as rejected bulkle parts due to exceptional blemishing or having an elephant foot. Uh, this one part has an elephant foot. You can kind of see it there. It flared out where it uh, met the the, um, the base of the, of the 3D printer. So those aren't exactly alternates as they are just um, spares cosmetic spares or cosmetically defective spares. So here are the mouthpiece parts. It's it's really a couple of different designs. I believe this is one of them in these two parts. And then I think this is the other design. Oh, I see. This is the one where you get to choose which cup you want. Or maybe it's just two different printings of the same part. That looks like possibly it. This one has some issues in here. It didn't come out quite right. Whereas this one printed a lot better. And then there's the, the shank. This one has a shorter shank than the other one. It may be a more authentic mouthpiece design. Feels like it would be playable. It's a little rough, but not bad. And it can be sanded slightly. They would be functional mouthpieces if I glue them together, and I think I will. All the parts in this bag that I just had out are all printed at a uh, 0 0.1 millimeter increment size, so a tenth of a millimeter. All these other parts were printed at a 0.2 or 0 0.2 millimeter, so twice the uh, step size, and um, they're in here, but they look a lot rougher, so again, they're just out of curiosity. I may glue those together too. So, two bags of mouthpieces, four mouthpieces total. One bag of bulkle parts, one bag of rejected bulkle parts. 
20 pieces that I can stick together and glue up to a 3D printed serpent. Well, here's proof that all the parts are here, nothing's missing. I can pretty easily form up the 20 pieces into the appropriate serpent shape. There's just quite a lot of gluing to come up here. Probably a good project for tomorrow, but uh, I don't see any gross discrepancies in the diameters. And the overall shape is correct, and I think with the bocal and the mouthpieces put together, it should turn out quite well. Alright, I'm going to commence assembling this 3D printed serpent. Following the directions, it cautions that even with a apparently good 3D print quality, there can still be pinhole uh, cavities, pinhole leaks through the wall. And remember that these are not solid plastic throughout. If there was a solid uh, fill from inner to outer, then even a pinhole wouldn't propagate all the way through. But since it's really a thin inner wall and a thin outer wall, and then a infill that's only 30 some odd percent, and the rest is air, a uh, pinhole, even on just the inside, maybe not the outside, could result in some less than ideal acoustical properties. So they really recommend using some sort of a sealer, and I've decided to try this polycrylic protective finish. It's a water-based uh, uh, waterproof essentially uh, finish and I think I'm going to brush on one layer of that. Um, it's supposed to completely dry within two hours. I've got a couple of small foam disposable brushes that'll even fit into the smallest parts of the serpent. Maybe not the bulkal. Um, for that, I may just pour some of this in there and slosh it around and let it drain out to give it a thin coating. So I'm going to start out doing that first. Alright, all the parts have been coated on the inside with the polycrylic. Just the one coat, but I really worked it in. I didn't just smear it on lightly. I uh, brushed it back and forth several times and in and out and all around. And so if there are any pinholes in the plastic, they've been plugged by this single uh, application. Alright, it's the next morning and all the parts have had their uh, sealant coat dry overnight and it went on milky because that's the color of it when it's not cured but it cures completely clear so it's barely visible on the inside and uh, just as a sanity check I've gone and lined all the parts up one more time this time taped together temporarily just to verify that I don't have any parts backwards or that something weird is going on and uh, I also have indexing pieces of tape stuck on, always pointing towards the mouthpiece end of the instrument, just so I don't get screwed up at some point during the assembly. It's a, uh, also a way to get rid of all the rubber banded on pieces of uh, paper that uh, the parts had when I received them. This way I'll be able to handle them a little better without those pieces getting in the way. So the next step is to sand all the joints to make sure that they're absolutely flat and there's no little bumps or burrs on them. And also I have to go around the inside of each section right on the end to make sure there's no little uh, ridge that'll uh, cause troubles with the way the instrument plays. I didn't really see any but I'm still going to go around and just lightly sand those areas. I'm still a little concerned about the bocal because it doesn't quite look the way it does in the photos. Uh, this part seems too short but I guess it's okay. There might have been a slight design change since the time the pictures in the, in the manual were 
uh, taken, that's possible. I do have my decorative uh, metallic ring temporarily stuck on there. And of course this much of it here is going to go inside of here. Pretty much about the amount that it overhangs now will be the amount it goes in. One thing that's uh, possibly visible here, it almost looks like there's two joints here. This is the only part I have where there was a filament change in the 3D printer uh, halfway through doing the part or, I don't know, three quarters of the way through. The machine is designed when it runs out of filament to just pause, then you can put in a new piece of filament and it continues, uh, but it does leave a little line there when it does it. Um, I was concerned that there might be a hairline leak there, so this morning I went through and put another coat of the polycrylic, a very liberal coat on the inside there, just to make sure there's no hairline uh, leaks. On the mouthpiece parts, the uh, increment, which is only 0.1 millimeters, that's the minimum increment on that printer, it leaves a slight stair step that may be visible there when it's trying to make a taper. So I've got this chucked up in my metal lathe. I could have just put this and, you know, held it in one hand and rubbed some sandpaper around it, but I decided to try it uh, on the lathe. flatter than my fingers and it'll probably work better for this. It's getting smoother, but it still has a bit of a ridge there. I can still see the lines a little bit, but they're uh, definitely smoothed out, so I think that's going to do it. For sanding the ends of each section, I've got taped down to my workbench a sheet of, uh, I don't know what it is, it's probably about 200 grit sandpaper. And then I've got uh, another sheet of about 320 grit sandpaper, this is more like an emery cloth. Um, just for uh, doing very light sanding. And uh, so I've got my mouthpieces I'm starting out with. As I already showed that I turned the, the shank down a little bit on this, I've sanded this surface, sanded that surface, I've sanded the face, made it nice and smooth and rounded the edge a little bit. That does result in discoloring it a little bit, of course. Um, I did similarly here on the other design of mouthpiece. 
I haven't done the shank on this yet because I couldn't chuck it up in the lathe uh, when it was this small. I have to wait till it's glued together, then deal with the uh, the rough shank on there. For assembling the serpent, um, Mark Wikowski, who came up with the design and recommending that if PLA was going to be used as the uh, the printing material, which it was in this case, that uh, methyl dichloride solvent be used. And uh, I was searching online and in some stores trying to find that, and I could find all sorts of things that seemed pretty close to it, but were not exactly the same. And then I was looking online also on mostly forums for people doing 3D printing since PLA is a very common material. Uh, I was looking to see what they were recommending for the strongest bond between pieces of PLA printed material. And uh, it seems that they were recommending a dichloromethane material otherwise known as DCM also known as diclo and that weld on number three which is a a product by SCI grip and their brand name is weld on uh, would be ideal for that however that material is very runny it's almost like water and I'd called the manufacturer and said hey you know I'm trying to do chemical welding of PLA and they said, yeah, are they, are they little parts? Are they precisely fit? Can you wick the solvent in between the parts? And I said, no, that's not likely to happen. They're fairly big parts. And uh, even though I'm going to sand them, they're not going to fit together like two sheets of glass. Uh, and they said, well, then the number three is a bad choice, even though it's the ideal solvent. Um, and they recommended their number 16 which is similar it's a uh, methylene chloride as they say and I was trying to find out if there's different versions of that and it seems like it doesn't have the dye in front of it so it's a slightly different chemical methyl methylene might be the same my days of studying chemistry are decades behind me so I just don't remember this stuff um, but I know that this worked when I repaired my earlier 3D serpent, which was mostly glued together with CA or cyan cyanoacrylate glue or super glue. Um, and when a joint broke on it, I repaired it using this same weld on number 16, and it seemed to work pretty well. And also, I found a lot of endorsements online for using this successfully. It may you know, some people were saying it might not be quite as strong as the uh, uh, methyl dichloride, but I'm not sure what the actual differences are chemically for this exact plastic. Anyway, suffice it to say, I'm going to put this instrument together with weld on number 16 methylene chloride. However, it's also interesting to note that this is sort of a witch's brew. It's not just methylene chloride. It's also got methyl acetate, methyl ethyl ketone, which is an almost universal solvent for plastics, and methyl methacrylate monomer, monomer. Uh, so uh, I think it'll be fine. And I'm going to start out with these mouthpiece parts. My technique is going to be, as it was when I tried it on the other serpent, to put just a, uh, a very slight bead on there and smear it around on both surfaces to be joined, and then let it set just briefly to react with the plastic and soften it and if it looks like I need it, I'll add another tiny bead just to use as a filler more than anything, and then stick the parts together, wipe them off, and let them sit for the recommended 24 hours 
doesn't really take 24 hours, but that's the recommended uh, to be absolutely safe that it's uh, ensure that it's completely done. And there's absolutely no need to wipe the sanding dust off of here, although I did it anyway, because as soon as I put the solvent on it, it's going to melt all of that, and it's not going to hurt the joint at all. It might actually help it. So there's the rough bead, and there it's smeared around a bit. And there's the other side, and there are the two parts pushed together. I twisted them a little bit back and forth after I joined them, much as you would with um, using chemical solvents such as acetone on uh, PVC pipe when you're joining it. Same reason, same effect. Okay, there's the other mouthpiece. Got to set these aside now and start working on the big pieces. All of these pieces except for the, the bell end and the mouthpiece end have alignment holes also where the bocal goes into the main body but other than that they all have two alignment holes. The instruction manual suggests sticking in short pieces of the uh, 3D printing filament to use as alignment pins. However, A, I don't have them because I'm not the guy who printed these and also uh, the person who did print them said that the uh, filament that he's using for printing them is too small and just rattles around in those holes. So um, I want to do what I did on the other serpent when I needed to align the pieces and that's just use some pieces of copper wire. And I have here a scrap of uh, 12 gauge copper wire, that's 12 AWG American wire gauge That's just about exactly two millimeters diameter on the wire. After stripping the 12 gauge wire, I have a couple of marks that are one half inch apart or uh, 12 millimeters. And that's just about the right length for those wires to be cut to. Here's how those copper wires go in the holes. And uh, it's apparent that they're not too long there. And those do hold the parts in alignment pretty well. They, they can shift slightly, but at least they're going to be, they're not going to be rotated as more important than lining them up exactly. I'm still going to have to fine tune that on every joint. You know, it can be, I don't know, half a millimeter off, but uh, more importantly is to not get them rotated, and that's the main purpose of those alignment pins because if you get just a little misalignment going all the way around then uh, the serpent won't be straight when it's completed. All right I've got the first two sections of the bocal that are curved and the first two sections of the bocal that are straight joined together with the solvent. I don't want to join more than two pieces together at a time. So I still have this piece, which will go on the other side of that. Uh, but I should be able to join that one and this one together in another effort. I'm just trying to minimize the amount of handling that any particular joint gets when it's still not completely uh, dried. I should also mention that this solvent evaporates very quickly so the method I'm using is to uh, smear a, uh, put a bead around one side, smear it with my finger, protected by a glove, and then on the other side do the same thing. That kind of pre-softens the surface, but if you wait too long it dries, so you have to do it really quickly. And then uh, put another bead around very quickly, stick the pins in, stick them together, and because the wire is a little undersized, 
you press them together and twist back and forth so the surfaces rub against each other just a little bit and you can kind of feel it setting up and uh, at that point then I'm taping it that's really just for the small pieces I have a different technique I'm gonna try for the bigger pieces so here is the next piece I'm going to sand and it's pretty good but it's uh, got some ridges and some slight unevenness so I'm going to sand it in an orbital pattern that's already a big improvement knocks the dust out of the holes and now I'm gonna take just a little bit of sandpaper if I can find where I put it and go around the edges the inner edges just to remove any burrs that might be in there I should actually be using my next coarsest piece of sandpaper for that. But I ran out, so I have to cut another piece. your sandpaper. That's pretty good. So now I'm just going to keep doing likewise. The uh, plastic that comes off when sanding tends to peel up a little bit uh, after doing just one piece. So what I found effective is um, I just vacuum off the sandpaper after doing both ends of each piece. <laughs> Even places where it doesn't seem like there's any black dust, on the first pass of the vacuum cleaner, it becomes very apparent and then it gets vacuumed away. So I think that works pretty well. Another thing is that, especially with the curved pieces, the uh, piece tends to chatter on the, uh, on the sandpaper and you can adjust the pressure you're using but a fairly firm pressure seems to be best but it's important to hold the piece right down by the sandpaper instead of even up a little bit that encourages the chattering but if it's held down here then it moves pretty smoothly all right all the big parts are all the black parts have been sanded and are ready for bonding so I'm gonna start it one end and do two pieces and do the two next pieces and so on so I'll end up with 10 pieces instead of 20 pieces at the end of the day. And then it'll get reversed geometrically easier every day. Because there will be half as many to do as the day before. So I'll get busy with that now. 
have to cut a few more uh, wire uh, alignment pins. So as I work on this, another small refinement, I found myself almost putting a couple pieces in counter rotation to the way they should be, even though I knew better. Just worried about other aspects of it and almost putting it in so it curves the wrong way. Uh, so I've decided to reline everything back up to make sure I've got the correct orientation of all the parts and then I've put um, little pieces of green masking tape on there just so it contrasts with the blue tape I've got for other alignment purposes and uh, every other joint is uh, diagonal or straight so the diagonal one is uh, to make sure you don't put one end backwards and then the green is always up in this orientation that's another thing that it offers but if you find yourself putting a piece in backwards like this, then you'll see there's no green parts. So I think that'll be a useful safeguard. All right, every other two pieces, or every two pieces, are uh, now glued together and taped up. If you just kind of uh, rock them back and forth against each other when joining them to the degree that the alignment pins will allow you to do so, then you can really feel it setting up um, when you're basically mixing the two slightly uh, molten, if I can't think of the proper word, but slightly dissolved surfaces of plastic starting to merge into each other. And then as the solvents evaporate, you can feel it gripping pretty well. So um, I'll have to wait 24 hours and then come back and. Uh, start gluing this up a little bit more. Alright, the next day, 24 hours since I did the first gluing, uh, I've tested all the joints and I can't pull them apart. You know, short of throwing them against the wall and stomping on them and putting all my weight on them, they seem to be pretty well locked together. And that includes even the ones with relatively small surface area and a lot of leverage like these bocal parts. So I think I'm on the right track. I just have to start gluing up the bigger sections or the smaller sections into bigger sections. Now the trick here will be that it's pretty simple to glue two pieces that are adjacent because they're not substantially different in size and taper. But as you glue up the bigger assembly you know, this whole thing is on a center line once it's assembled that cuts right through the center of all this. So obviously, if it's laying on a flat surface, it's not going to be able to do that and still keep all the parts lined up. So from this point on, I'm probably going to have to do progressively more blocking and shimming of the assemblies. So I have to test that on each part before I actually glue it to make sure I have appropriate shims nearby. Okay, so those two bocal subsections or subassemblies are joined together, but following my uh, method here of not joining two joints together on the same subassembly, I can't put this one over here yet. That'll be for tomorrow. But I have joined these two pieces subassembly and this two piece subassembly together. These two and these two, these two and these two these two, and these two, and finally these two, and these two. So the only thing left for me to do today is to uh, give a little more attention to these mouthpieces now that they're supposedly uh, set up the way they need to be. Let's see. They seem to be pretty well joined. I can't break them apart. Okay, so I'm going to put them on my lathe and sand them down slightly. And we'll go from there. And there are the two mouthpieces. This is the one that's more like a modern instrument, a very deep funnel-shaped mouthpiece. It's almost more like an Ophiclide mouthpiece, actually. 
and uh, then there's this one that's more like a normal serpent mouthpiece. Actually, it's still a little deep to be a classic serpent mouthpiece, but it's presumably a copy of an original. Um, I'm just not sure which original. They're all over the place in terms of size, shape, uh, rim, throat, cup profiles on serpent mouthpieces. Uh, the original ones used for accompanying plain, uh, plain song or plain chant in the French Catholic churches supposedly had a fairly uh, shallow mouthpiece with a very abrupt throat on it and that helps give the instrument its uh, very vocal um, somewhat diffuse sound that is uh, what they were after so it would blend with the voices and not stand out as a musical instrument playing along with the voices. This one here is going to sound a lot more like a modern brass instrument. So I'm not going to show myself playing, but I am going to play for the camera. Oops. <laughs> Same thing. Fuddled the last one because I was running out of breath already. Took a shallow breath. Anyway, so if you print both mouthpieces, then you get a choice of which sound you're going to get. Okay, this is day three of the joining operation. I've joined the last vocal section. I've made a new joint here with four pieces on this side and four pieces on this side. A new joint here, four pieces, four pieces. There remains this joint and this joint, which will be done tomorrow. And I'm also at that point going to put on the, um, the metallic sleeve up here. And that should complete the gluing, and then hopefully it'll be airtight and no uh, gaps have remained. Okay, back at the gluing. The bocal is done, and I did a pressure check. I blocked one end with my hand and blew into the other as hard as I could, and there was no leak. Um, Similarly with this section, I cupped my hand over this end, blew into there, couldn't detect any leak. And uh, even after I stopped actively blowing, it was just sealing it with my mouth, releasing my hand made a nice pop, so it seems to be sealed up pretty well. My technique seems to be in validated by that. And that's not going to be so easy to do it here because I'd have to plug six holes. I'm only going to do that if I detect an actual problem with this, I think. Or maybe, hmm. Yeah, so I just threw some electrical tape, a couple of parallel passes overlapping over each hole, just quick and dirty. Covered up that end with my cupped hand, blew into that as hard as I could. Couldn't detect any air leakage, so once again, even with the bigger joints, I think it's turning out well. This is going to be a short gluing day. The, uh, the only thing I really need to do here, and the only thing I can do according to my self-imposed rules, is join this part to this part because I've made that rule that I will make no assembly that requires one, more than one glue joint at a time. So I can't do this joint and this joint because that would be two joints on the same assembly. I have to save that one till tomorrow. That reduces stress on the joints that I did do. Um, makes it a little easier to manage as well. So um, I'm just going to glue that guy up. It looks like I don't even need to block it. It's just going to lay nicely on the table by itself. So that'll go pretty quick. And um, I don't know, I'm kind of contemplating maybe making this other 
mouthpiece set while I'm down here in the basement even though they're they're not exactly rejects they're just ones that are printed with a 0.2 millimeter um, printer increment so they're rougher in finish but you know I think that'll be okay I'm gonna do that then I'll if nothing else I'll have a spare set of mouthpieces I can use this mouthpiece and my other 3D printer which I don't currently have a dedicated mouthpiece for Okay, there's the new joint. It's almost done. And uh, the two mouthpieces made out of the rejected parts. This one I'm not going to use. It was just an alternate cup for one of those. And it was done on a very rough printer uh, palette or platen or whatever they're called. So it came out real rough. I don't think I'd want to sand that enough to get it smooth. All right, time to glue on that last section, big and heavy section. The instrument is quite unwieldy now, presents a lot of problems. I can't do this one laying flat. It's the only part I haven't been able to do laying flat, and that's partially because of the bell flare, uh, but also other reasons of the geometry. Uh, I tried blocking it, and while it would be possible to do that, it was so tenuous and tippy that I'd have to do something much more elaborate than I was prepared to do to uh, block it laying down to support everything properly and if you breathe on it wrong it just falls apart. So what I came up with, and I think this will work, is I got an old cardboard box, cut the top off of it, uh, notched it down here, have the instrument body uh, sitting uh, up against the one side, I cut it out down here so I could put a, uh, a small beam clamp in there. And similarly up here, I have some weights just because it's a little bit on the point where it wouldn't take too much for the whole assembly to tip over on its side. With a little bit of ballast over there, it's not going anywhere. And then I made up a cardboard shim, which fits around the body here has exactly the right amount of distance here and also goes up in there to help center it so it doesn't swing one side or the other. And with that, this is the joint here. It's a little, it can still go like this, um, but I'll just hold it till the, the uh, solvent tacks enough that it's not going to slide in that direction. And then I have a plan to I haven't got it on here yet, but just a little piece of wood that I'll put a couple more beam clamps on to force it in the right direction to line up flat that way. Uh, it's possible I could have worked this so the whole thing would have been tipped a little bit more that way, but I decided this was good enough. With the pins in there, this is not really going anywhere except to slide slightly this way. That end holds it in the right, correct position and gravity sits it down here. It's It's got a nice seam all the way around. There are no gaps in it so I should be able to glue this up and uh, have it work out. Cross my fingers. Alright well that's glued. It seemed to work out about the way I planned except for a bit of ugliness. Um, after I had rubbed the pieces together as much as the pins would allow, just a little bit this way, a little bit that way, a little bit of twist, but I couldn't do much twist because this was mostly preventing it. So it was mostly just moving it that way against the sloppiness of the pins and then a little bit that way. And I could feel the joint tightening up to the point where it didn't want to move anymore. And then as I was going around congratulating myself, I saw a very fine gap over on this side. And it may have just been uh, a little bit because the edges were a little bit rounded off and it might not have really been a gap. Certainly I couldn't budge it anymore at that point, so I followed Mark Witkowski's instructions when you suspect a gap, and I just used more of the adhesive or the uh, solvent as a filler and rubbed it around the joint. Actually, I went all the way around. And that's why it looks so ugly there. It's the ugliest joint 
on the instrument. The uh, adhesive itself lends a certain amount of that, plus you know the plastic has a texture from the 3D printing and um, you're melting that and smearing it around a little bit so it's it's an ugly joint but the whole horn is really ugly <laughs> in general so um, that's not going to be a deal breaker. Wish it wasn't so but that's the way it is. So now I just have to let it dry and uh, I, I didn't think to put the the ring on here at this point in time but it's not structural so um, I'll stick that on tomorrow when I start fitting the um, vocal to the rest of the instrument and that doesn't get glue that's just it requires some string wrapped around it or um, Teflon tape or something to seal it up so the only other thing I have to do right now is take these other two mouthpieces made out of scrap and do the same treatment on them as I did on the others just sand them a little bit on the lathe alright so the instrument is in one piece now I just glued on the decorative metallic band around the uh, mouth or the vocal receiver and the vocal does go in. Um, I had hoped that this would be adjustable, but because of the taper on here it is not, so it can't be tuned. That was a, a failing of the design on the other one um, that I have as well. It, the Authentic Serpents just had a cylindrical fitting here and they weren't tapered, but um, the designer of this uh, apparently thought it was best to taper them because that's the way it's done on modern brass instruments. And it can be wedged in here. It probably doesn't even need to have any uh, tape or anything on it, even though the instructions seem to suggest otherwise. But the instructions are written for both designs of Serpent, the anonymous one and the Dittus model, which this one is. This one I know had an improved vocal design, but while it's not tunable, it does wedge in, whereas the other one didn't wedge in properly, so um, that limits the usefulness of the instrument because if you can't pull the vocal in and out to tune it with an ensemble, then it's going to be harder to use it. But hopefully it's fairly well in tune with it the way it is. So it's time for a test blow. Here goes. Serpent mouthpiece, 3D printed. Now for the one that's got a bit more of a modern profile to it. Here's the uh, full shape of the cardboard fixture I made to assemble the last section. One thing to note about 
3D printing of these parts, especially ones which you have to use for the mouthpiece or very cosmetic areas. Um, it depends somewhat upon the uh, printing surface or platen of the 3D printer. Uh, some of them have relatively smooth surfaces that the part gets printed on from the beginning. Other ones have smoother surfaces. Some have, you know, it's rougher or smoother, let's put it that way, in various degrees. Um, this is what you can expect on some of the rougher surfaces. And uh, let's see. This is perhaps uh, typical of the ones with the smoother surfaces. And this is what you can get with the printed up uh, side. So this is the top side. And it can be quite smooth. I mean, it's always going to have some tiny ridges in it from the different passes of the filament, but it's, it can be quite good. Um, also, you have to watch out for artifacts like this, which can happen in certain areas. It seems to mostly happen in very tight areas. Uh, there were a number of parts that had to be uh, unused or disposed of due to issues like this in critical areas. Now here's an experimental part which uh, was printed just for fun. There are, in addition to the rigid uh, PLA materials, there is a flexible filament. This one was printed out of the flexible material. It has a very different feeling. It's almost a little bit grippy when you rub your finger over it, as if it had a very slight adhesive property to it or was a little bit rubbery. And I don't know if it's going to be apparent here, but... Yeah. It may or may not be apparent from the photo, but... Uh, You can see the somewhat coarser finish here. You can see more lines, they're a little bolder, just a little bit more sandpapery looking compared to the somewhat more satin look here. It's just a, I think it's due to better control of the filament and uh, perhaps smoother motions of the, the uh, print head really. Um, by the uh, computer software that's driving the printer. So, uh, starting with this and part number one, these are all printed on a Prusa printer up to here, and then these are on a Creelty printer going around up to this end. But the uh, vocal parts were all done on the Prusa the same one that did these parts up here, the bigger ones. There's another anomaly here. You can see where the filament ran out about two-thirds through this uh, piece, maybe three-quarters actually, and the printer allows for that, but you can see a slight line there where it, the uh, filament had to be changed. And I mentioned that elsewhere where I took extra precautions to make sure that was sealed up on the inside in case there were any uh, pinholes that might go through and make a small leak. The inner surface here is tapered uh, with the large end of the taper towards us and then it tapers down to a somewhat narrower inner diameter until about a third of the way down where it goes to cylindrical and then finally ends at that abutment down there which throttles down to the actual inside bore of the of the tubing that uh, persists from that point on and that's where the uh, end of the bocal fits up against in theory uh, if the bocal is inserted all the way but here's the whole bocal and this part of it right here 
is the part that fits inside the body of the instrument. You can kind of see where it tapers down here and then it goes cylindrical. The idea being that under most circumstances you would just push this in all the way and this tapered part would come up against the tapered part inside the body of the instrument, the receiver if you will, and just wedge in there and make a tight uh, airtight seal and also tighten up enough so that the vocal doesn't flop around while the player is playing it. And then this part lies just inside the inner diameter of the receiver and this part here goes up against that abutment inside there. And this inner diameter matches that throttle down section we saw inside the receiver. But I'm told by the creator of the plans for this that the fact that this is cylindrical here before the taper is some thread can be wound on here to make a uh, air seal and then that can, at least in theory, uh, be used to tune the instrument. It allows a little bit of motion, perhaps about an inch of motion outwards but not inwards. So I'm going to try that and see if that's practical. So I'm going to try the tuning here um, on three different C's. And that's with just the very slightest lipping up. It wants to be just a few cents, you know, five cents, seven cents or so lower than that, um, for example. It's floating around there if I'm just totally relaxed. Uh. I can push it all around, but that's typical of serpents. It doesn't lock in on any uh, particular frequency. You can push it around with your lips very easily, and that's the whole secret to playing the serpent is that if you try to play it like a regular brass instrument which wants to slot in to most uh, frequencies due to the pretty tightly controlled resonance you're not going to get the right notes. You have to take command of the instrument with your embouchure and think I want to buzz this frequency and then buzz it and hear and adjust. Um, so um, that's with the vocal all the way in. Now if I take it off of its docked position and bring it a little bit further out. Okay, this is now with the vocal roughly one inch pulled out. It's about as much as I can have it pulled out and still have the cylindrical section seal up without just falling out of the instrument. noticeably flat there, um, something on the order of 20 cents flat. And if I close it up a bit, push it in maybe half an inch from there. And go in almost to the point of the taper locking in. Taper is now pretty much locking in. It's 
so it does have some tunability. Um, I wouldn't say it's as far as it would be on a normal traditional serpent where you can move the vocal in and out a bit more than that, but it does have some tunability.